Look at you, look like you have something up your sleeve. No, not at all. I'm just happy to be here. Okay, this is interesting to me because Always. you're a sports writer. Have yes. you written a book? Uh, not not a real book. Okay, this. Always, what do you mean not a real book? What I mean is I had a book of columns that I had published that yeah. were already published, just compiled into a book. You know, but I want to write a book. You know, here's what's funny. You're a writer. And you haven't written a book. Sports writers are lazy. You guys write two columns what? a week and go home and eat. Burritos. It's hard. It's hard to write a book. I wrote two while doing a radio show and a TV show but and Colin, being married with six kids. You write a book every single day in your head. Yeah, but I had to use a you pen. You just speak. It, it's in tough, a book. wasn't it? Tough. It's, it's the a, hardest thing I've ever done in my it's life. It's a very difficult somebody, thing. Bill Simmons once said, uh, "Bill Simmons, the ringer and stuff." And uh, one sometimes somebody asked him about. Uh, he wrote a book that was really the popular, the longest book in the world. Yeah, it was like uh, yeah, that basketball thing. Right, it was a very, right. very good book. I got through about thirteen columns, and then it was I just I, I was exhausted. It was. You know, Bill writes forever, like just big, long stuff. It's very good. I'll still use it occasionally as a reference point. Anyway, somebody asked him about a second book, and he's like, are you kidding me? That was the worst experience of my life. But I hope I get Tom Brady's book for Christmas because I got a door that won't close, so I got a door stop I could use. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Charles Barkley's talking about the NBA players now. Uh, the current NBA players – have um, there's been there eased, eased up the schedule. There's not as many back to backs. And here's what Charles Barkley said about it. You know, these poor babies can't play back to back games. We just want to make it convenient for them. That 40, 50 million dollars they're making a year just can't stress them out. The private jets and the four star hotels is not enough. So I just want to commend the NBA for just making it so convenient for these poor babies. What do you make of that? I love Charles Barkley. Can I say that? Yeah. Because Charles Barkley is as honest as it comes, especially for a guy who's doing analyst work for a, a network that has the NBA contract. And he's gone out and said, hey, this stuff is unwatchable. He's called the players out when they need to be called out. And this is another example. Poor Adam Silver, the commissioner, is an enabler. Yeah. Stop it. Well, you know, the back-to-backs – Guys don't want to play. You know what their positions are? Their, their, their occupations are players. You play for a living. Yeah. And these guys don't want to play. Take a game check. This whole notion, let's start the season earlier so there's no back-to-backs. I've been covering the NBA, Colin, since 1987. When I first started covering the NBA, the players flew commercial flights they used to be on the planes with everybody else. And you know what? There were only four or six uh, first-class seats, so stars had to sit in coach. These guys are six foot eight, sitting in coach, flying across the country. And they had to take the first flight out of every city that morning. So you know how many 6 a.m. flights I was on the runway, you know, in, in, some co in Cleveland or somewhere? It's a winter Detroit. league. Yeah, in the and winter league. Snowstorms. And so that's why you had to take the first flight, just in case – to be able to make it to the next city. So I saw the players who really, now they have massages, um, masseuse and cooks and chefs, and, and they're spoiled rotten, and it doesn't show up in the play. It's embarrassing, to be honest. You, I hate the NBA for that reason, from the standpoint that for all the luxuries that these guys have, they don't give back. They don't give back to the fans to watch some of the best basketball that we should be watching. Well, I started uh, my show, and I'm going to talk about this next hour as well, that Kevin Durant, I totally get it. Everybody talks about their first love. You never forget your first love. Do you remember who your first love is? Yes. What's her name? Uh, I can't remember. Let me see. Then but I do remember, remember her. her. Mine, no, I do I, remember her. Mine was Tony uh, Hecker. Wait, her, you her loved name, her, her and you don't remember her name? But her name was, like, Giggy. It okay. was like a weird name, so but okay. yeah, I do remember. Okay. I was like crazy about it. Now, how old are you now? Fifty-three. How old was she? How old was your? your we were like uh, nine, eight, okay. or nine years oh, old. Okay, well, that so makes sense. Four, you yeah. loved her at nine. Well, you know what I mean. I was crazy about it. I would say I was like head over heels, like in love. Yeah, I mean they didn't like drive a Lexus to work in the morning. No, and it wasn't or... like that. But I'm just saying, I remember having those feelings for her. Okay, early on. So that's my point. So Aww. forty years separate. That moment you fell in love, you still remember your first love. But yet we're all crushing Kevin Durant because he went through the biggest public divorce in America 15 months ago. Now he's America's villain for 15 months. And we're shocked that, yes, he still thinks about OKC. He's still bothered by it. He's still emotionally scarred from it. I support Kevin Durant. You're crazy because Kevin Durant is, you ready? Yeah. The Pote. P-O-A-T. <laughs> 
pettiest of uh, all time. Oh, come on. That's what he is. Colin, he's petty. You know what? Here you are. How old is Kevin Durant? 28 years old or yeah. something, right? Yeah. Got a pocket full of money, sneaker brand doing well, just won the MVP of the NBA Finals, just won his first championship. You should be in Europe enjoying your life and having fun. Instead, you're in the basement of your mansion uh, uh, tweeting to, to anonymous people, 18-year-olds who are in their parents' basement, making fun of you? That's your life? Kevin Durant? Yeah, but you're saying basically that money solves insecurity. No, it's not about that, but you should be doing something else with your life. You have to have a terrible life to worry about Twitter when you're that guy. I understand if you're Joe Blow and you work at McDonald's and there's nothing else going on and you got to kill four hours <laughs> before your next shift to make fries. I get that. Are maybe you kidding connects, me? Maybe he connects more with those 18 year old kids who yeah, just your, love basketball and want to talk basketball. I think all day. we're tough. Did you see the Yankee game yesterday when uh, Frazier hits a foul ball, hits a girl in the head, and he starts crying? No, I get that. These are human. These are that human I, beings. That I get and I understand. But but I just don't understand. I just think Kevin Durant has gone, and it just hasn't been that the whole summer, ripping ripping uh, Curry sneakers. I mean, look at what he's done all summer. What what is what is his Mission this summer. I don't. He just got. He just got validated. He left. Everybody gave him a hard time. He he won a championship. He was the MVP. Just enjoy that. You don't have to say anything else. Everybody knows you won. He won. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from the herd, or go watch a few segments from the newest show on FS1. First things first with Chris Carter and Nick Wright.